how many billions of dollars are going to maintain these nuclear weapons while we are not protecting ourselves from COVID-19, for example, while we're not investing in a universal healthcare system, while we're not investing properly in our public schools, when we're not investing in our infrastructure, in the kind of housing that would ensure that people aren't sleeping on the streets. That's the voice of David Vine, professor of political anthropology at American University and author of the new book, The United States of War, A Global History of America's Endless Conflicts, From Columbus to the Islamic State. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. We'll get into today's episode in just a second, but first, we wanted to thank you. Yes, indeed. We've been through a lot together this year, from COVID-19 pandemic to war scares to missile tests and a historic election. Uh, And we've been able to cover it all week in and week out, thanks to your help. But there is so much more work to be done, and we need your support. If you can, please go to plowshares.org and make your year-end contribution. Your gift will help the fight against nuclear dangers at every level, from grassroots action to the halls of Congress to the White House, and it will help us keep giving you all the nuclear news you need every Tuesday. We really appreciate it. But now, back to today's show. Tom, what do you have lined up for us on Early Warning? Today, we talk about President-elect Joe Biden's Secretary of Defense nomination and what it means for the future of the Pentagon. After that, we kick off the first of a series of interviews led by Plowshares Fund board member and Hollywood actor Farshad Farahat about human impacts of foreign policies. He sits down with American University's Dr. David Vine to talk about his new book, The United States of War, a global history of America's endless conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State. Given all the discussion about ending endless wars, this is a very timely conversation. And lastly, I answer a question about what a follow-on agreement to New START would look like in this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. We really get a kick out of answering your questions on the air. And we know we ask you this a lot, but we really mean it. If you like what you hear, click the subscribe button and give us a rating. And if you can, tell just one person, whether a colleague, a family member, or someone in your pandemic pod about our show this week. Every little bit really helps us grow our audience and our impact. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. Last week, President-elect Joe Biden nominated retired General Lloyd Austin III, a former commander of U.S. military forces in Iraq, to be his next Secretary of Defense. If confirmed by the Senate, General Austin would make history as the first African-American to lead the Pentagon and its enormous bureaucracy. Uh, Like General Jim Mattis under the Trump administration, Trump's first Secretary of Defense, General Austin would have to get a congressional waiver to serve since he has been out of the military for only four years and U.S. law requires a seven-year waiting period Uh, between active duty and becoming Pentagon chief. And after retiring, General Austin joined the board of Raytheon Technologies, one of the world's largest weapons makers. Uh, General Mattis, uh, in his in his case, served on the board of General Dynamics, uh, another major military contractor. And his successor, Mark Esper, was a former Raytheon chief lobbyist. So what are we to make of all this? To help us sort it out, uh, Danielle Bryan, who is the executive director of the Project on Government Oversight, uh, is here to help us out. Danielle, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here, Tom. 
Uh, Danielle, uh, you tweeted, and it was quoted in the New York Times, uh, you said, oh, come on, uh, a general and Raytheon board, possibly the worst of all options, bad news for civilian control and any real distance from the military industrial complex. So, so let's talk about this. I think there's at least three issues we need to separate here. Uh, there's, there's the race issue, there's civilian control of the military, and, and the corporate connections. So in your, in your view, uh, how should we balance these, these three uh, separate and in some ways competing interests? They are definitely competing interests in this case. And I think you're right to start with race because uh, we are at a time where I, I appreciate that the Biden administration has been or the transition has been very public about leaning in on having the most diverse cabinet. And I do think it's of real significance to have a black secretary of defense, particularly given that uh, the the armed forces are disproportionately uh, representing uh, black people. There's 17 percent, I think, of the armed forces are black. And it's crazy that this would be the first time uh, the civilian leadership would be a black person. So I do think that really matters. And I think it's something we should be really working towards. The question is, do we need to uh, normalize some of the bad things that have come from the Trump administration by saying uh, that is that is the only thing that really matters right now. And let's just forget these other factors. So um, I first think that when it comes to race, one of the things that sort of answers the third part of where you were going, which was, uh, you know, well, who would be a good uh, Secretary of Defense? We would argue that there have historically been uh, members of Congress and uh, members of the Senate who come in to be really terrific secretaries of defense without these kinds of conflicts. The problem, though, is when you look at the natural committees that those members would come from, the House Armed Services and the Senate Armed Services, they are really disproportionately white. In fact, right now, when we're having this last Congress, a really important debate over uh, bases being named after Confederate generals we only had one black person in the entirety of all the House and Senate Armed Services Committee. So I think one of the first things we need to, to recognize is to encourage black members of Congress to join those committees so they can have better representation than they currently have. So that's what I would say on that particular point. On, on um, civilian control, we're already starting to normalize what the Trump administration has done. Did you realize that prior to Trump, we had had 30 years of secretaries of defense, none of whom had come from the defense industry? I think that's a really hmm. important standard that people have already forgotten. And then having had Mattis as the first general to become secretary of defense since, uh, since Eisenhower, uh, now it's become normal because it just happened. So I think that these are really important consequences that that I think if people see the history, they'll recognize there are other people who would be breaking barriers. For example, um, Senator Hirono from Hawaii is a perfect example of someone. Why is her name not being considered as someone who, who would be a perfectly uh, reasonable candidate? Or Senator Claire McCaskill, former Senator Claire McCaskill, who, when she was in the Senate, was really active in um, Senate Armed Services and overseeing the Pentagon. So these are the kinds of things that I think we shouldn't be normalizing and we should be looking to having a, um, a clearer picture of the kinds of pools of people who, sh who should be Secretary of Defense. So I, I, what I hear you saying is that there should be some way to, to bring all these things together, right? To give us a candidate that does break barriers on, on uh, race and gender. Uh, for example, but at the same time, doesn't raise these concerns um, of uh, of having to get a waiver um, for military service or the connections to um, the defense industry. And if you could just for a minute, you know, lay out what are your concerns um, with asking for the waiver and the defense industry connections? Well, starting with the waiver, uh the real problem was, and if you even just go back to when the waiver was being considered in the Congress uh, for General Mattis, at that time, those who voted for it and some who voted against it, you know, this must be the last time this happened. This cannot be normalized. And we're already normalizing it in such a short period. The reason is you need to have, for a Secretary of Defense, someone who has a broader experience 
than simply that where they're within the, the uh, chain of command in the military. The, the whole point of the structure of the military is to execute policy decisions that are being made by politicians. You now are starting to morph this question and now having the military involved in the development of the policies. And that's never been our structure, even going back to the founding of our country. You know, when you think about how George Washington, having been a general, thought it was incredibly important that he not serve as a military leader as our first president. He was a civilian leader. You look around the world at, at governments where uh, the military has too much control, and it's really alarming what you see. I mean, that's part of the foundation of our democracy is that it is run by civilians. So that's my step one on that question. And then when it comes to the military industrial complex, uh, our, my, our point is we have sort of this ongoing narrative of uh, throwing more money into the defense budget makes us more secure. Well, it's sort of demonstrably true that more money isn't helping us win wars. And, and at a time now with COVID where we're having a huge economic crisis and a huge uh, demand for national security needs here in the United States, we have to have someone who has, uh, whose loyalties aren't coming strictly from sort of defense industry experience. And I would argue that those who are coming from the boards of the top five defense contractors that job is to ensure you know, the highest profit uh, margins for those companies. That's the mindset of their job when they are on those boards. That's not who we need to be the Secretary of Defense. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. There's the siren. I have a feeling we're going to be discussing this issue um, for a long time to come. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for being here. Okay, Tom, thanks. My name is Farshad Farahat. I'm an Iranian-American actor and a member of the Plowshares Fund Board of Directors. As a survivor of chemical warfare in the Iran-Iraq war, I want to uncover stories that show the real human cost of foreign policy. For this special series of conversations, we'll ask, when it comes to national security, who is truly safe? Whose voices are heard loudest? Whose lives are buried? And who is profiting? At Plasher's Fund, our mission is to ensure that everyone has a right to a safe and secure future. In this series, we'll explore the experiences of those striving to heal from military and ethnic conflict. Welcome everyone to Press the Button. My guest today, David Wine, a professor of political anthropology at the American University in Washington, D.C. David's newest book, The United States of War, a Global History of America's Endless Conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State was recently published by the University of California Press. The United States of War is the third in a trilogy of books by Vine about war and peace. David is also a board member of Costs of War Project, a team of 50 scholars who facilitate debate about the cost of post-9-11 wars. Welcome, David, to Press the Button. Thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for joining us. And David, I'm going to jump into a fascinating chapter in your book that caught my attention. All of it did really, but this one just hit me hard. The permanent Indian frontier. How is our military expansion around the world today linked to the United States early wars against Native Americans? A great question. And I, I think a, a really important connection to make. My work has focused on U.S. wars and the infrastructure that has made U.S. wars possible for the last 19 years. That is, I've been working on this for 19 years. But I, I think for many years, I have overlooked these connections, these longer term connections between the wars fought really uh, since U.S. independence against Native American peoples and nation, nations um, for, for roughly the, the first 100 years of the history of the United States. Um, that, that we need to see the connections between those wars and the wars that are being fought today uh, across the Middle East and, and, and beyond. The U.S. military has been fighting in uh, at least 24 countries since 2001. And, you know, I, I came to this book thinking that this was sort of a, an exceptional period in U.S. history, that it was unusual that people entering college today, uh, most of them, haven't lived a single day when they can remember the United States not being at war. But as I looked 
more carefully at the history, I saw that this was not unusual at all, that this is part of a, a, a lo much longer term pattern in which the United States military has been fighting a war and some other form of combat in every year, with the exception of 11 years in US history. That's around 95% of the years in US history. And as I say in the book, I, I think it's important to, to look at the even larger context, and that is uh, to place the the history of U.S. wars in the context of European imperialism, uh, that, that the United States gains its independence and leaders, U.S. elites, white male elites, model the United States explicitly after the European empires that had been colonizing the Americas since 1492. So that's the, the context uh, in which I think we have to see the, the history of U.S. wars and the, the history of, of, of the last now more than 19 years of, of, of war that, that followed the attacks of 9-11. To me, that really captures the, my next question for you, and um, is that, you know, when you say European colonialism, do these wars, whether coming from the Native American wars all the way to Islamic State wars right now, is there an undertone of European white supremacy in our policy toward these countries, toward these wars? And how have they manipulated our population to pay for and carry out these wars? How has that racism, how has that white supremacy influenced our willingness, our country's willingness to engage in these wars? In, in short, I, I, I think the racism that underlies the last 19 years of war and the entire history of, of U.S. wars has made it easier for the U.S. government, the U.S. military to, to wage wars. It's made it easier uh, for far too many people in the United States to overlook the death and destruction, the injury, the displacement that these wars have inflicted, uh, again, in the last 19 years, primarily you know, in places including Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Yemen, Somalia, and the list goes on. But I, I think this does tie nicely to your first question in that we can, we can see some of the connections and the, the abiding significance of racism when we look at uh, some of the language that, that members of the U.S. military, unfortunately, use uh, when deployed to places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, there was a, a journalist who uh, visited actually some of the, the less well-known U.S. military bases around the world and frequently heard from U.S. military personnel, welcome to Indian country, welcome to Indian country. And this is, you know, not in the 19th century or 18th century. This is in the last 19 years of war. Um, and you can see similarly uh, the kinds of racist epithets used to describe Afghans and Iraqis and others uh, echoing the same or very similar racist epithets used to describe Native Americans, African Americans, enslaved people, and, and the, the, the freed uh, descendants of, of, of enslaved Africans, uh, as well as uh, you can see in, 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 in the, the war that followed uh, the Spanish-American War of 1898. The U.S. fought, U.S. military fought a, a long and, and bloody war in the Philippines uh, to essentially uh, take over the Philippines as a colony, uh, a war that lasted until 1913. Uh, and again, you see the N-word, for example, being applied to Filipinos. Uh, and, and we see similarly horrific uh, kinds of racist epithets sadly being used to describe uh, Afghans, Pakistanis, uh, Iraqis, and, and many others. You know, I, th that to me, that kind of awareness that that you bring, that you're talking about, is key to challenge uh, the military culture and structure as it's related to our people, uh, as the support of our people for these wars. So I feel when our people realize that a lot of this has same racial undertones that we have had toward our African-Americans, Native Americans, and the movements that have risen against these, these, these um, forces that have paralyzed our country. I feel this is a way to attack the military um, structure that we've had with governments across the world or with, with countries across the world, especially non-European descent countries. No, if, if I can just jump in there, I, I think this is a moment when we can make those connections perhaps even more 
easily for, for some sad reasons, um, but, but we can take advantage of the, the growing awareness uh, of uh, the kinds of, of police violence, police brutality, um, police assassinations of African-Americans and other people of color. Uh, the fact that you know, white people in particular uh, are waking up to this sort of violence that has been a, a structural part of the United States, uh, we can show the connections between the kinds of violence that have been inflicted on, on people at home, um, people of color at home, and the kinds of violence inflicted abroad. And that connection is key, I think, for our awakening and uh, our community, our Caucasian American communities, to realize that that is not in their benefit. It is not in the U.S. Uh, security interest. And uh, so gathering all that, what I found interesting was background to how you came about to these revelations, to these understandings. Um, I understand that you attended a Quaker school and that your family has a direct connection to the Holocaust. How did that upbringing shake, you know, shape your career choices, your research interest, and, 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 and really opening our eyes to these issues? I think that those backgrounds uh, did play a, an important role in, in how I ended up writing this book, The United States of War, and, and, and my whole career. The other major influence that, that I think I, I really want to point to is my being exposed to the story of the Chagosian people. Uh, when I went to grad school 19 years ago, I actually began my research focusing on gentrification in, in New York. Uh, but quickly uh, found myself engaged in a, a different kind of research after getting a very lucky phone call uh, from a lawyer who was representing a group of people called the Chagosians, uh, people who had been exiled from their homeland by the creation of a U.S. military base in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And I very luckily got to be involved in uh, documenting the effects of, of the Chagosians' expulsion and exile on their lives, uh, as well as uh, having the, the experience of really having my, my eyes opened to the massive collection of, of U.S. military bases that encircle the globe, now numbering about 800 U.S. military bases outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C., in around 80 countries uh, and territories. Uh, and this, uh, you know, equally um, made me pay attention to the way that U.S. bases abroad, U.S. bases overseas, have uh, for decades um, and really now centuries, as I show in, in, in my new book, uh, enabled U.S. wars, enabled the long history of U.S. wars, and not just enabled these wars, they've actually made war more likely. They've made it far too easy for U.S. elites, for U.S. Uh, policymakers, U.S. leaders to choose war as a policy option and to wage war uh, on a worldwide basis. So, David, you know, your book, and to that, to, to follow up with, with, with um, the example you just gave, uh, the approach you've taken, I feel, to U.S. foreign policy, especially when it comes to its military policy, has been a human approach, has been uh, coming through an anthropologist's approach rather than just a core political scientist. Uh, tell us about what anthropology, the understanding of the human nature, where we come from, where we can go a a as a community, how that can help us in, in really humanizing the cost of our military engagement across the world and with our own minority communities, as you mentioned, here in America? I think it's a, a great question. And in, in many ways, I'm not a huge fan of the academic or social science disciplines, but I, I do think anthropology is helpful for a number of reasons, especially when it comes to considering questions of, of foreign policy, of international relations, that all too often, I, I, I believe, are discussed in an incredibly abstract way, in ways that, that really take the human beings out of the picture, out of the equation, and instead focus on, on, again, abstract and really undefinable notions of national interest that uh, people portray as something that can be identified objectively, but of course are entirely dependent on who is identifying the interests at hand. Uh, anthropology forces us to focus on the individuals involved in any, any given setting. Um, and for me, has, has, has forced me 
uh, to focus on the human effects of war in, in any consideration of, of U.S. wars. Um, and that's why in my book, I, I, I try to uh, emphasize again and again what the wars in U.S. history have meant for people, for human beings, regardless of nation. So that includes um, people who have been on the, the receiving end of U.S. invasions, um, the people in the countries where most of the U.S. wars have been waged, um, but also for U.S. military personnel and their families, who I see as, generally speaking, being among the victims of war. Uh, the people who have been sent, who, of course, all, all too often um, have been disproportionately poor, um, and in more recent years, people of color. You know, what really stood out to me in, in, were several statistics and data in your book, and I'll get to both categories. But the first category, 4 million combatants and civilians have died in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen due to the U.S.-led wars since 9-11. And even today, we see 80 million Iranians under sanctions, under brutal sanctions, with they can't get food or medicine, during a pandemic because of U.S. sanctions, these economic and military wars, how do we humanize the cost to our population, to our civilians here, who really have the ultimate say in regulating and controlling the military? In the end, it's our tax dollars that go predominantly into these wars. So how do we mobilize? How do we humanize these numbers uh, to, to our population to, for them to wake up? In, in a way, and I'm not saying wake up in a derogatory way, but just wake up to understanding the human cost that's going on right now. I, I think educating people about what's going on is critical. And I, I think you're right. It, it, it's, it's not a matter of, uh, of waking up because uh, people are, uh, are stupid. Um, I think a lot of it is a result of the in, intentional policies that have been designed to either obscure or hide or, um, or, or disguise the, the human effects of war, as well as, as you pointed out, the, really the theft of, of money from U.S. taxpayers, the way in which uh, trillions of dollars, $6.4 trillion, trillion with a T, $6.4 trillion has been spent on the post-9-11 wars uh, largely without the knowledge of, of, of people in the United States, of the people whose money that, that, that has been expended. Um, so I think we both have to make people in the United States aware of, of the way in which uh, their money has been stolen and, and then make them aware of the really horrific damage that has been, been inflicted uh, with that money. Uh, and yes. I, I think most people in the United States, you know, in, in many ways, myself included, have not even begun to reckon with the, the damage that, that the U.S. wars just since 2001 have inflicted on Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Syria, and beyond. Uh, you pointed to the, the estimate of, of between three and four million people dying in just five of the, the bloodiest, most violent wars the United States has been engaged in uh, since 2001. Um, this is in addition to um, by an, an estimate that I carried out with a group of terrific students from American University. We estimated that 37 million people have been displaced from, from the eight most violent wars the United States has been engaged in since 2001. Uh, and we can imagine the, the injuries um, uh, surely number in the tens of millions as well. Uh, most of the attention in the United States when it comes to these wars has been on the U.S. military personnel who have died. Those lies are incredibly important too. Again, I, I think of them as among the victims of war, but I think we need to extend, um, and perhaps this is where the anthropological approach is helpful. Again, we need to extend our, our empathy uh, to the, the far, far larger numbers of people who've died, who've been injured, who've been displaced by the post-9-11 wars in countries uh, beyond the United States. Yes, and, and, and even with our U.S. personnel, and, and whether contractors or military personnel, we don't see them on our news being the, the, the visual of them being killed, their be, them being you know, uh, 
paralyzed or traumatized. Uh, we don't see the effect that they, it has on their life, the suicide rate that is extremely high amongst um, veterans. I feel if we, again, humanize that, where we see the damage that's done. I lived through the Iran-Iraq war. A million people died when, in Tehran. It's brutal. It's brutal to the soldiers. There's no glorification to it. There's no glory to it. But here, it seems like we glorify it. We do not show the pictures of our killed soldiers. And that, I think, creates a myth for our people that war is glory. War is just patriotism without any question. So I agree with you. And again, to follow up, there's a heartbreaking story in your book about a U.S. soldier who joined the military in hopes to take care of his child's health care needs. And the anecdote ends it with horrendous tragedy. Can you talk about that? And can you talk about how we can humanize the pain our soldiers have gone through? Yeah, I, I many ways I, I began the book because I wanted people from the beginning uh, of the experience of reading the book to connect to the human lives that have been um, so uh, dramatically affected and, and all too often ended uh, by U.S. wars, um, to connect to the experiences of, of military personnel, of, of family members, of, of the many other victims of war. So I, I tell the story of Russell Madden, who indeed uh, joined the U.S. Army uh, because his son was born with cystic fibrosis, a, a lifetime disease um, that requires medical care over one's lifetime. Uh, and he had been un unable to secure a job with uh, health insurance that would have taken care of his son, uh, of course, because he uh, and we live in a country that does not guarantee health care to all its citizens. Uh, so he joined the military knowing that no matter what happened to him, his son would be taken care of for life uh, as a result of veterans benefits and, and health care while he was on active duty. Uh, a year into a deployment in Afghanistan, Russell Madden was, was killed in Afghanistan, uh, leaving his son without a father. Uh, and so I, I begin this way to, to try to get readers to connect uh, with uh, with the human damage that wars uh, cause, uh, because as you as you said, uh, so much of our culture in the United States glorifies war, makes uh, war look uh, look look like you know the Hollywood movies, um, and I, I think we you know we hear uh, frighteningly talk of of a, a, a new civil war um, in the United States, and I think people who who talk in these terms and the, the people who, you know, show up to protests uh, armed to the gills uh, really have no clue what, what war means. I think, you know, people like you um, who've lived through war know how, how horrific it is. Um, and, and I think uh, part of the work that we need to do is to uh, get beyond this glorification of war, to, to counter the glorification of war, and to overcome the, you know, again, systematic public relations campaign that the U.S. military and the U.S. government more broadly has waged since Vietnam uh, to uh, repair the image of the U.S. military in the wake of Vietnam and to systematically cover up the, the human damage that these wars have caused to, so that we won't see uh, the suffering. And instead, we'll just focus on the, the sort of fantastical weapons, the, the, the glorious weapons that, that uh, TV journalists all too often celebrate. And unfortunately, the, at the pinnacle of that glorious weapon is the nuclear weapon. Uh, you know, here at Plasher's Fund, our mission is to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, the word nuclear shows up in your book more than 50 times. In discussing how analysts view a potential war with China or Russia, you mention one often senses a certain sports-like enthusiasm in such talk, despite the potential for millions of deaths, if not planetary nuclear annihilation. I, I found that quote very telling to this point that we're talking about right now. Where, where does this attitude come from? Is it unique, unique to the U.S.? Uh, or is this a human, you know, as we talk about anthropology, is this just a human way of, 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 of approaching uh, domination or our human relations? Where does this nuclear weapons 
and the romanticization of, uh, of a nuclear war stand right now and the dangers it has? I think with nuclear war, largely nuclear weapons have fallen out of the consciousness of most people in the United States in the wake of, of the Cold War. People who were born after the Cold War don't remember living in a world where you would go to sleep not knowing if you would wake up the next morning or if there would be a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, that was a very real fear, I think, for many people in the United States and in the Soviet Union, uh, in other parts of, of Asia and, and in, in Europe. Uh, I, I, I think, the, the like you said, sports-like enthusiasm that we hear from, I think, all too many people in uh, the, the world of, of military relations, of, of foreign policy, um, and within the military itself, about what many are perceiving as an inevitable war between the United States and China is, again, really horrifically frightening. The, the fact that they could even conceive of any kind of conflict between uh, the two countries, uh, that they could conceive of a conflict like that not spiraling out of control um, and potentially leading to nuclear war between these two nuclear armed powers is, is truly frightening. Um, and I, I think uh, the you know, abolition of nuclear weapons, the re reduction in the number of nuclear weapons that the United States has on the way to abolition has to be a major priority uh, for, uh, for a Biden-Harris administration and for, for anyone concerned about war and concerned, again, about the, the theft of, of our tax money. Um, you know, how many... Uh, billions of dollars are going to maintain these nuclear weapons while we are not protecting ourselves from COVID-19, for example, while we're not investing in a universal healthcare system, while we're not investing properly in our public schools, when we're not investing in our infrastructure, in the kind of housing that would ensure that people aren't sleeping on the streets. Um, this is the kind of theft that I'm talking, to, talking about and trying to point to in the book. Uh, and that, that, that point comes across very clear. It comes across that we need, and, you know, there, there has been two forces, I think, in our human history since 2,500 years ago, when the Persian Empire globalized the world for the first time, or created global empire, then you had Greece, Rome, Britain, and now the US. They've linked racial supremacy, demagoguery, economic gain to maintain the system. But along the way, we've evolved by multiculturalism, by the technology bringing us together, bringing our economies more linked together, our cultures linked together. And I feel like we need to get to a stage where that connectivity for climate change, for fighting climate change, for, for, for fighting pandemics, for fighting poverty, that connectivity needs to grow. In your opinion, where are the first steps for that cultural, economic connectivity to take place in the modern world? It's been going on. This battle's been going on, and evolution has shown that we're winning. We're more connected today. We've, we have more cult cultural understanding of each other today. But where do we find the next step in the fight against nuclear weapons, the spending on nuclear weapons and greater war, and to focus on common enemies, climate, pandemics, poverty, etc.? So a, a great and critically important question. And, and you know, I, in my book, try to focus not just on diagnosing the problems uh, when it comes to the long history of U.S. wars, but also pro pro providing and proposing some solutions and alternatives. And I, I do, to, again, to go back to your question about, you know, is this human? Um, is this just part of who we are as human beings? It's absolutely not. Um, anthropological research has, has shown that 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 you know, it is deeply uh, our, our, the connection to war and the history of U.S. war is shaped by political and economic forces, not by some uh, inborn uh, drive or um, universal tendency. Um, there are, of course, peoples who who have not known war as. Uh, uh, Margaret Mead and others have, have pointed out, um, war is not a human universal. Uh, so I think we need to take advantage of the COVID pandemic, in fact. And this is something that, that is connecting people around the world in, in the sense of, 
people around the world are, are having common experiences of being afflicted by the, the COVID pandemic and attempting to respond and the kinds of mutual aid efforts we've seen around the world um, should inspire us and show us that, that, that we can build deeper connections across nations. Uh, equally, the kinds of protests we've seen around the world, the kinds of protests here in the United States, the movement for Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which then has inspired people to protest against police brutality, again, on a worldwide basis, in addition to, to protests that have been building from Latin America uh, to Asia, to Europe, to Africa, uh, really uh, around the world, um, should be inspiring and should be something upon which we can and must build. Again, equally, uh, the, the protests um, to properly address global warming, climate change, um, led by young people, uh, should be a model we can build on. And you know, one of the things I, I try to argue in the book is that all too often movements are, are segmented from one another. Uh, and we need to try to, to bring movements together to show how um, the anti-nuclear anti movement, the anti-war movement is and must be intimately connected to the, the movement to address climate change, global warming. Um, it is intimately connected to the, the struggle against racism, against poverty, uh, against homelessness, um, beginning with the money. Um, the fact that the, 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 the trillions of dollars the United States has invested in war is money that could have been spent to transform the U.S. economy into a green economy. It could have been spent to mitigate the effects of global warming and the displacement we're likely to see. It could have been spent to address poverty, to end hunger, um, to end homelessness. Uh, so I, I think this sort of cross-movement uh, networking and cross-movement uh, building of uh, a sort of supra movement of movements um, is is really critical if we're going to address the world's problems. David, that's a great ending to our um, session here. That's exactly what we need, and that is going to be developing in hopefully the years and decades to come. Uh, I hope everybody checks out David's book, The United States of War. David, thank you, and we hope to hear and read more from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. And now, everyone's favorite nuclear question and answer time. This week's question comes from Bill in Nevada. Are you ready for this, Tom? Bring it on, Michelle. Bill asks, we hear about the New START treaty, but fairly little about what will follow it. What do you think should be covered in the next agreement? And do you think it'll happen? Uh, Bill in Nevada, thank you very much for your question. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's a great question, Bill. And I guess this is the first thing I would say about it. Um, given what we know about what the Senate is going to look like, kind of regardless of what happens uh, in Georgia in January. I would suggest the Biden administration that as they go beyond New START, they should think about alternatives to treaties. Uh, because as we know, if the Biden administration goes for a treaty with Russia, uh, they'll have to seek two-thirds support from the U.S. Senate. And as we learn from the New START uh, debate during the Obama administration, if you don't have uh, sufficient support, uh, if the Republicans in the Senate uh, decide to uh, make it difficult to get that treaty through, the price that is paid could be too high. And uh, certainly in the New START experience, we wound up uh, with, in exchange for Republican votes on New START, having to uh, go for a modernization program of the nuclear arsenal that is now upwards of $2 trillion. Um, so I would, I would strongly caution against going for another treaty at this point. But that doesn't mean we can't do things. There's plenty that can be done by executive agreement uh, between the United States and Russia. And those things should be the kind of things you would expect in a follow-on treaty. For example, lowering the top line of deployed nuclear weapons. Uh, right now, the New START treaty is at 1,550 
deployed strategic weapons. I would love to see that come down uh, to a thousand or less. Uh, I think we need to start lowering the numbers dramatically. To do that, we're going to have to talk about missile defense with the Russians. The Russians are very concerned, particularly as they get to lower numbers, that U.S. missile defenses will interfere with their ability to retaliate to a possible but highly unlikely U.S. strike. Uh, not having it be a treaty would make that discussion more possible uh, because it would be very difficult to get any kind of limitations on missile defenses um, through the Senate. But if it's an executive agreement, uh, that opens up new avenues to limit missile defense. And the last thing I would say is it's not all about lowering numbers. Uh, to me, the greatest risk is not that we will use nuclear weapons um, on purpose or by intent, but by accident that will blunder into nuclear war. So this would be a great opportunity to work with Russia uh, to reduce our alert status, to reduce the possibilities of blundering into nuclear war. And this should become part of the strategic dialogue between the United States and Russia. Another week, another question. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Bill. And remember, if you would like to get your question on the air, Tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.